The BBC presents The Strange and the Sinister, a series of four short stories written by Professor William Croft Dickinson of Edinburgh University. As a sideline, Professor Dickinson writes short stories of the supernatural. They are fiction, but fiction so well integrated into history that they have an uncanny sense of reality. He calls today's story The Sweet Singers. I've no idea when our Scottish Inter-University's competition for the Professor's Challenge Cup at golf first began. And the cup itself exists only in the name. But of the popularity of our annual gathering, there can be no doubt. And since the competition is played by handicap, with the handicaps assessed by old McElwain of St Andrews, under some abstruse Stone Age system of his own, in which the average of previous scores is reconciled with years and weight and girth, even the very worst of us can still play his round in the hope that the non-existent cup will be his. Upon this particular occasion, our meeting had been held at North Berwick. We had been favoured with a lovely day, and the luck of the draw had partnered me with my old friend, Andrew Lomas, who held the chair of natural philosophy at Aberdeen. As it happened, moreover, both of us had decided to stay overnight. We had booked at the Douglas Arms, and we had been given adjacent rooms facing the sea, and each with a marvellous view of the massive bass rock standing like a sentinel out there in the sea at the mouth of the Firth of Forth. At first we'd thought of an after-dinner walk to Tintallon, but with a cold east wind blowing in from the sea, we adjourned to the smoking room, where the only other occupant, a somewhat stern-looking minister, gave no sign that our conversation distracted his attention from his book. What we talked about I can't remember, nor is it of any consequence to my tale, but about eleven o'clock we were both yawning and ready for our beds, and once abed I was soon fast asleep. I hadn't been long asleep, or perhaps I should say that that was my impression, and it's a common impression and often a common fallacy in similar circumstances, when I was awakened by a gentle but persistent knocking in my bedroom door. Lighting the bedside lamp, I slipped out of bed and into my dressing gown and opened the door. And to my surprise, Lomas, also in pyjamas and dressing gown, at once stepped into my room from the ill-lit corridor outside. Hope I haven't disturbed you, he said, quietly closing the door. Then, without waiting for an answer, he walked over to my window, drew aside the curtains, and stood there with his head turned slightly sideways as though listening intently. I moved over to join him. Strange, he whispered. I can't hear it now. What was it? I asked in a low voice. But Lomas only motioned me to be silent, and so side by side we stood, tense and expectant, by an inn window overlooking the shadowy outline of the inhospitable bass. Suddenly I sensed that Lomas had stiffened, and at that same moment my ears caught the sound of a distant singing. The singing seemed to be that of many voices joined in harmony, but although there was this impression of many voices, the sound itself was little louder than the whisper of the wind, so faint that it came and went with the rhythmic plash of the waves. Yet there was also this. With the singing, I seemed to be no longer within the confines of the room, but out in the open air and in the spaces of the night. You heard it, whispered Lomas. I nodded. I knew it couldn't be my imagination, he continued. Shall we open the window? It's coming from somewhere outside, but who are they? And why are they singing at this hour of the night? I pushed up the window, and we drew our dressing gowns closer as the chill night air came into the room. Almost at once, there again came the sound of singing, this time somewhat louder, though again the sound came and went with the noise of the sea. But this time, with a start, I suddenly found that here and there I recognised a word, and with that I found that I was hearing, or perhaps mentally supplying, whole lines. Yet, Lord, hear me crying, to thy mercy with thee will I go. But who could be singing that old metrical version of the 51st Psalm? With the end of the sixth verse, the singing ceased. Lomas looked at me with a query in his eyes as we stood, still listening and still waiting. But now only the sea disturbed the silence, 
the singing had come to an end. Lomas pulled down the window and turned to sit on the edge of my bed. And what do you make of that? he asked. Well, I replied, all I can tell you is that whoever they were, they were singing the 51st Psalm and they were using the old version in the Gid and Gordley ballads. And I gave Lomas a brief account of that interesting work. Huh, was all his answer. We'll need to sleep in it. And that means we'd better get back to bed. And he left the room. And slowly I slipped off my dressing gown and nestled back once more into my bed. For a time the singing echoed in my ears and I still puzzled over the strangeness of it. But sleep soon intervened. With the knocking of the chambermaid in the morning my mind at once flashed back to the singing in the night. I hastened to the window and looked out. But the light of the morning offered no clue to the mystery of the night. And still wondering, I shaved and dressed. There were only three of us at breakfast, the minister, Lomas, and myself. And at first, neither Lomas nor I mentioned the strange singing. But when our landlord came in, Lomas gave me a quick glance. You haven't a mission hall near the hotel, have you? He inquired casually. No, sir, replied our host promptly, but with a look of surprise. Oh, it doesn't matter, replied Lomas. We had some singing in the night, that's all. Singing? Yes. Fifty-first Psalm. But our landlord only shook his head. Oh, I can't make anything of that, sir. And no guest ever spoke to me of the like before. It sounds strange to me. But I'll make inquiries. And still shaking his head, he went out of the room. Pardon me. It was the voice of our fellow guest, the minister, and we both turned. You have received a singular favour, he continued, and his eyes under bushy eyebrows seemed to cover both of us. A singular favour. You have been privileged to hear the sweet singers. The sweet singers, we asked in one voice. Yes, replied the minister. And though I have long known the story of their singing, never have I had the assurance that their singing can still be heard. We waited in silence. Wardrow, I believe, has a brief note concerning it. But there is a fuller and better account of it in the book, Jehovah Yere, The Lord Will Provide. One of you, I understand, comes from the University of Edinburgh. Well, that book is in the University Library. Perhaps it would be as well if you read for yourselves, for I could not hope to tell you the story in equal words. And yet I am deep in your debt, sirs. But now I have met two who have heard the sweet singers, and I know that their singing shall never cease. The minister had risen from the table. He walked towards the door and there turned. I thank you. Assuredly, the Lord will provide. And with that he was gone. Well, needless to say, Lomas and I returned by the next train to Edinburgh, where we at once made for the university library. There, the librarian soon put Jehovah Yeri into our hands. It was a small book, an account of the sufferings of the Covenanters in the time of Charles II. But it wasn't indexed. We sat down in the professor's room and turned over the pages, hastily reading the rubrics as we turned. And about the middle of the work, we saw the heading for which we looked. The Sweet Singers. Here it is, Lomas exclaimed. And there... With heads bent together, we read the following account. Mr. Robert Wilson, being imprisoned in the bass with many others, did fall into a heavy sickness, and did call for two others, and did dictate out the rest of a paper which he had been before writing himself, and did subscribe it before them as witnesses, who also did subscribe, wherein he gave faithful and clear testimony to the work and the cause of God, and against the enemies of his word. And thereafter his discourse was ever that he longed for the time of relief because it was so near. His breath being very short, he said, Where the hallelujahs are sung, there is no shortness of breath. And that night he became weaker, but spake as sensibly as ever, and blessed those around him with heavenly expressions. And so began he to sing the 51st Psalm, but with great difficulty, and then stopped a wondering and said, 
Will none of you join me in the singing? Even in the old version as it was sung by Mr. George Wishart on the night that he was taken by his enemies. Thereupon those around said, Sir, we will join with you. And so did they sing again the first verse, even as those around Mr. George Wishart had sung with that blessed martyr. The sound of their singing spread as with wings, and was heard by many more who in turn joined with their praise, so that as it were in the instant all those within the bass had lifted up their voices in praise, and the sweetness of their singing reached out even to those upon the distant shore. And in the end of the sixth verse he cried out with a loud voice, A singing of glory, a singing of the angels, Hosanna, Hosanna! And so passed he from the singing of the faithful on earth to the singing around the throne. Nor shall that singing of the faithful in their affliction ever die. Two score years have now passed, and in them have been counted five men in East Lothian who have heard that psalm reaching their ears across the waters from the bass. The sweet singers shall yet be heard when the singers themselves are no more, and the sweetness of their singing shall never cease, but shall endure unto the very end of time. He that hath ears to hear, so shall he hear. We turned the pages, but the story of the sweet singers had been told, and the succeeding entry bore on a sermon preached in Mabel. Strange, muttered Lomas, no one can persuade me that sound waves never die, or that if we could but tune ourselves in aright, we should be able to hear the wisdom that was spoken by Solomon or a sermon that was preached by Knox. Science can find no place for fancies such as those. Yet, we did hear that singing in the night. He that hath ears to hear, so shall he hear. But how? That's what I want to know. How? I looked at Lomas, the natural philosopher, and remained silent. Perhaps silence was the only answer. That was The Sweet Singers by William Croft Dickinson. It was read by Moultrie Kelsall and presented by the BBC.